Okay, so tonight's lesson, we're going to get into the meat of it. So uh, tonight's is the wife's responsibilities. Uh, next week will be the, will be the husband's. Um, so ladies first, this is your, this is your, <coughs> your uh, you know, time to, to go at it. So but this is lesson three, and we're going to be getting into the, the meat of what this is, what our lessons are about. So but the, it's the wife's responsibility. So God has designed marriage and given us the purpose of one flesh. We talked about that. Um, as we strive to do that, he gets the glory, right? As we, as we try to do what he wants to do, he gets the glory. In his design, he's given us, he's given the responsibility to the husband and the wife to complement each other, right? To complement each other. As we follow his design, there's great joy, fulfillment, happiness, companionship. That's, that's it. But as we follow his design, that's the key. As we follow his design. The problem comes when we skip that first part, we follow his design. We do our own thing, right? We've seen plenty of examples of people taking products and items and using it for the purposes that it's not supposed to, and that it's not good, it doesn't end well. It's the same thing for a husband and wife. It's exactly the same thing when either of them don't understand the responsibilities, don't understand it, um, just not going to do it, just refuse to fulfill God's, God's things that are instructed. Maybe they, they just don't know, never been taught. But there's great confusion, frustration. It causes problems, right? And it's not going to end well. The marriage is not going to end well. So we have a choice. We have a choice tonight. We have a choice to make. Listen to our culture or listen to God, right? Uh, what we, we can listen to how we think or how we feel or listen to God. Uh, what our favorite podcasts say, uh, what our favorite shows say or whatever, or listen to God. So the New Testament frequently commands wives. We're going to get right into it. Uh, it frequently commands wives to submit, right? So let's just, let's just let's start right there. So it's to obey, to be in subjection to their husband. That's what the Bible tell, tells us. Uh, we don't have to turn there tonight, but Colossians chapter 3, 18, Ephesians 5, 22 and 24, Titus 2, 4 through 5, 1 Timothy 2, 9 through 12. This isn't my idea. This isn't our church's idea. This is God's idea right out of the, out of the Bible. So this idea is a not very popular one in, in our culture, right? It's not a popular in our day. And I think it's because there's misunderstanding of what it really looks like to have this biblical submission. I'm sure there are plenty of bad examples <coughs> out there, right? There's plenty of bad examples of People that are using the Bible and you do this woman and you, you know, that's, that's not what, that's not what this is about. I'm sure there's plenty of those and our culture is screaming back anything but God, right? Anything but God. You know, the, the whole thing is I am woman, hear me roar, all that, that, all that stuff. And I can see, and I can see even in the church, there's questions. So let's first look at what biblical submission is not, right? What biblical submission is not. Let's turn our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5. Um, submission is not just for wives. It's not just for wives, right? It's a concept for all believers. Every believer. Every believer. Uh, e Ephesians chapter 5, and verse 21, says this. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. So before any, be, before, then it goes on to verse 22. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own, own husband as unto the Lord. Um, before it says anything about the wives, it's telling us, as all, all believers, submitting yourselves one to another. <clears throat> That's where it's at. That's where we are. It's a concept for all, all of us, right? It's a concept for all of us. You know, we live in, we live in, in submission every day of our lives, every day, right? We drive down the road. It's like, hey, there's a, there's a rules for this, right? We have a police officer in the room. Uh, the guys get crazy and they, they're not following what they're supposed to do. We see the lights come on and they pull them over. Going too fast, uh, driving on the wrong side. There's, there's rules. There's rules for this. How about this? Just going down to Sam's Club, you know, in the, maybe a Sunday afternoon to get gas. It's cheap, you know. Everyone's just, it's, a, it's craziness. There's rules. I guess there's rules, right? It just seems like it's chaos, right? But we have to follow. Hey, he was here first. The bigger truck, he goes in for, you know, there's, but there's, there's rules for this. In line, at Walmart, whatever. But someone has to be in charge. That's what this is. Somebody has to follow the rules. It's a matter of order. Uh, in part, it's a matter of order, practicality, to avoid chaos, right? The big picture, it's a matter of pleasing God. 
for us as Christians. It's a, it's a, matter, of, it's a matter of pleasing God. Submission is for all of us. So we're focusing on the wife's role tonight, and the submission does not mean that the wife becomes a wallflower, right? A slave, not allowed to have an opinion, has to sit quietly in the corner, uh, can't give advice. No, not at all. That's not what the Bible says, and that's not what the Bible talks about, right? That's not the view of, of women in the Bible. So let's look in uh, the excellent wife. Look at, let's look in, uh, in Proverbs chapter 31. Proverbs chapter 31. And we're going to just go through this um, tonight. But Proverbs chapter 31, this is the Bible's idea of, a, of this excellent wife. And this, and this is uh, set up like a, a, a through Z. Um, we'll look at Proverbs chapter 31, verses 10 to 31. So are we there? Okay. So verse 10, who can find a virtuous woman for her price is far above rubies. The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her so that he shall have no need of spoil. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. She, see, she seeketh wool and flax and worketh willingly with her hands. She's industrious, right? She is like the merchant ship. She bringeth food from, a, from afar. She rises also while it is yet night and giveth meat to her household and a portion to her maiden. She's a self-starter, right? She's up early. She considereth a field and buyeth it. With the fruit of her hands, she planteth a vineyard. You know, we, we can see what we can see. This is this is God's idea of this this excellent wife. She girdeth her loins with strength and strengtheneth her arms. She perceiveth that her merchandise is good. Her candle goeth not out by night. She layeth her hands to the spindle and her hands hold the distaff. Um, she stretches out her hand to the poor, yea, she reaches forth her hand to the needy. She's compassionate. Uh, she is not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with, uh, with scarlet. She maketh herself coverings of tapestry. Her clothing, her clothing is silk and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sitteth among the elders of the land. She maketh fine linen, and selleth it, and delivereth girdles unto the merchants. Strength and honor are her clothing, and she shall rejoice in time to come. She opened her mouth with wisdom, and in her tongue is the law of kindness. Uh, this, is, this is God's idea of this excellent wife. She looketh well to the ways of her household, and eateth not the bread of idols. Her children rise up, and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praises her. Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. Favor is deceitful, and beauty is vain, but a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her the fruit of her hands, and let her own works praise her in the gates. We see this is, this is the view of what God has talked about in this, in this thing. So when, the, when, when people say, ah, oh, the Bible is just old, old and fuddy-duddy, and, you know, and women, it takes women down. No, not at all. This is where, this is where it's at. So so we see submission doesn't mean that the wife is inferior to the husband, not at all, right? I think we'll look at us guys. Well, I think we'll all agree, right? That's not what the Bible here tells us, right? Submission does not mean she's inferior to the husband. Uh, was the boy Jesus inferior, inferior to, to Mary and Joseph? Let's look in, in Luke chapter 2. We see it all through the Bible. We see it all through Luke chapter 2. Maybe some of you could read that. Luke chapter 2, verse 51 and 52. So this is, when, this is when they went to the temple. Jesus is 12 years old. He's a little, he's a little guy. And he goes, to, he goes to the temple and he's teaching, right? He's teaching. And then I, he's coming back. So, yeah, if somebody could read that. Luke chapter 2, verses 51 and 52. Right. Uh, I guess you you read 40, verse forty nine there too. That'll help. Right. So that's what he's that's what he's doing. But uh, yeah, he and he he but he was in sub in, in the Bible in verse fifty one. He says, and he was in subject subject unto them. He was he was he was he was not inferior. He was in submission. He was in submission to them. Was Jesus inferior to his father? Of course not. But over and over, all through the all through the gospel, we see we see that he said, you know, but not my will, be, but thine be done. Right? 
he wasn't inferior, <coughs> but that was just a matter of thing. Um, he was doing. He was. He said over and over, um, "Not my will, but thine." The who, the who one that sent me. Jesus in the garden before the crucifixion. Right. Not my will. Let this cup pass. Right. Uh, we do not see inferiority. We see order. We see structure. We see division of labor, responsibilities. God's God's view of people. Let's look in uh, Galatians chapter three. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 28. Galatians 3, 28 says this, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ. That's what, in Christ Jesus. That's his, that's his idea. That's his, God's idea of, of, of when he looks at mankind. So, so this is what the Bible talks about concerning the wise responsibility in this idea of submission. So first off, and this is going to be a shocker. Are you ready? <clears throat> this is going to be a shocker. This will be a shocker. Um, her responsibility to make herself submissive, right, is her responsibility. It's her responsibility. Nowhere in the Bible does it command the husband to make his wife submit. It's not there, right? It's, it's the wife's idea. It's, the, it's, a, it's a matter between the wife and God. That's what it is. That's what it is. Let's look back in Ephesians chapter 5, that verse 22 says this, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husband as unto the Lord. As unto the Lord. That's where it's at. As unto the Lord. You, you're, you are, the wife is to submit to the husband a matter of her obedience to Christ. That's it. That's what it is. So, two, wife submission is a continuous thing. It's not a one and done. It's not a one and done. Oh, well, I, I, we, I made my vows and we said our peace and I submitted to you and then, oh, then we're done. Then we're going to live our life. No, that's, that's, not, that's not how it goes. It's a, it's a lifestyle, right? It's a lifestyle. Thirdly, the wife's submission is not a is not a, a mandatory command. It's not option. It's a mandatory command. It's not optional. It's not optional. Let's look in um, in First Peter chapter three. And again, this isn't these aren't my words, right? First Peter chapter three. Notice a few things from this passage. It's very <coughs> it's very telling. It's very important. Um, it explains what it is. So, First uh, Peter chapter three verse one says this: Likewise, ye wives. Be in subjection to your own husband, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives, while they behold your chaste in, in conversation coupled with fear. So it starts off. It starts off here. It says, "Likewise, you wives, be subjection to your own husband, even if they obey not the word." Right. So here's a, a, a unsaved man, and a, and a saved wife. Right, and she's she's not to divorce him because he's not a believer. Um, the Bible is clear that not to be not to be unequally yoked. Right, it's, it's clear of that. But maybe she gets saved and he's not saved. There doesn't say anything. Hey, you should you should divorce. No, you should you should try to win him with your conversation, your lifestyle. Right, your lifestyle. Um, uh, then look at look down at. Uh, well, I, I think of I can think back. I can think back in years ago. We had a lady in our class. And she was saved, and her husband was as far away from God as could be. I mean, he you know, just as far away. And this lady through her spirit, and we prayed for this guy. We prayed and prayed and prayed. Years went by. He finally got saved. It wasn't, it wasn't some, somebody that was able to get in his face and preach at him and blah, 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 some, you know, some, some kind of thing. It was her lifestyle. She won him by her lifestyle, her, for her consistently, her love. And, uh, and, and that was, that was, that was, a, it was an amazing, it was an amazing thing. So here we go, uh, talking about, it's talking about this, likewise you wives, in verse 1, be in subjection to your own husband. Let's drop down to verse 3. Whose adorning, let it not be the outward adorning, plating of hair, and wearing of gold, or of putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart, and that which is not corruptible, even the, the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is, in, which is in the sight of God great price. For after this manner, in the old time, the holy women also, who trusted in God, adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husband, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well, and are not, af not afraid with any, ama any amazement. So, it's talking about this thing, uh, of how this, this submission is not based on how the husband treats her, right? 
It's not based on that. It's not uh, based on the husband's abilities, the husband's wisdom, the husband's education, the husband's talents. Uh, we, th we think of the examples that's given here, Abraham and Sarah. We know there was many times that Abraham did not trust God, and yet she kept following, she kept su submitting. He was not worthy, and yet she submitted, right? So this passage is talking about the uh, spiritual condition. It's not talking about the spiritual condition of the husband, saved or unsaved. It doesn't say to divorce, right? Uh, no, to win by your wife's sub submission, right? Um, but this, sub this, this submission role for the wife is a spiritual matter. It's a spiritual matter. Just what we said in, in verse 4, it says, But let it be the hidden man of the heart, and that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. So this is inner beauty. It's this inner beauty. It's this meek and quiet spirit, this humbleness. Not only is it precious to her husband, a husband would appreciate that in, in a wife, uh, but, it's, but God holds it in high regard, right? It, it high, God holds it in high regard. Uh, so this, it goes right back to that as unto the Lord in, verse, in, in Ephesians chapter 5, 22. It's a matter of obedience. It's a matter of obedience to God. Not to a deserving or undeserving husband. That's not it. But it's an essence of our Christian life. Obe obedience. Obedience. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. John 14, 15 says this. So this, this, this rule of submission for the wife is to be done in the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, the Christian life, with, you know, sometimes we try to live this Christian life. We get tired. We get frustrated. We're trying to live it in our own spirit. We're trying to do it in our own thing. We get frustrated, and it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. So we're trying to do this on our own. It's not, it's not that what we can do. So how about this? How about this? We can get up in the morning, ask God to help us, right? That's, that's the key. Help, ask God to help. Lord, give us, this, give, us what, give us what we need for this day. Give us strength. Give us wisdom. Give us patience for grace, right? Um, if you have your book, I know some people have their book. I have it um, on page 19. I'll just read this thing about submission for a wife. It's really good. Um, we'll just go ahead and read it. It's on page number 19 in that, um, just like the third line down. It says he asserts this, uh, this Bill Gothard has this definition of submission. It's the freedom to be creative under, uh, under divinely appointed authority. Submission means that the wife puts all of her talents, abilities, resources, energy at her husband's disposal. Submission means that the wife yields and uses all of her abilities under the management of her husband for the good of her husband and the family. Submission means that she... Uh, sees herself as part of her husband's team. She is not her husband's opponent, fighting at cross purposes or trying to undo him. She is not merely an individual going her separate way. She is her husband's teammate, striving for the same goal. She has ideas, opinions, desires, requests, and insights, and she lovingly makes them known. But she knows that on any good team, someone has to, be, ha have to make the final decision and plan. She knows that the team members must support the team leader his plans and decisions or progress will not be made and confusion and frustration will follow. I think it's a, a great, a great definition, but that's it. Oneness, right? Oneness. And uh, as we, as we strive for that, the de that definition lines right up with Genesis chapter two. Let's look at there in Genesis chapter two, verse 18. As we just keep moving right in, right along. And uh, if you've read the book, there's so much, right? There's so much, and there's not enough time for us to, um, to go through it all. And I, you know, I would definitely say, yeah, go ahead and keep reading. Read the book if you, if you can to get a chance, and I think Tom's going to have some more coming up. But this lesson, this, this definition lines right up with Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. Um, it says this, And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a help me. Right, I will make him a help me, and that's that was the plan. Um, God said it's not good. In contrast to everything else, right? We've been through this before. Everything else in God's creation was good, and it was good, and it was very good, right? He keeps saying good, 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 and now it's not good. The man should be alone. It's not good. He's the man is incomplete. He's less than ideal. God's answer: a help me, a wife, right next to you guys. Right there. That's the one. That's the one that God gave you. It's an awesome thing. This help meet means it's an aid to provide that which he cannot provide for himself. It's not a degrading term. It's not degrading at all. It's the same word God uses of himself. Psalms 54, 8. Your God is my helper, right? 
um, in, in uh, Psalm 28, 7, and many others, God uses that same term, helper, to us. So it's not a degrading thing, um, but he's a, he says he's going to make a help me. To meet, the help meet means it's, a opposite, it's a, his opposite. She is to, in, in, is to correspond, to compliment him. She is his equal, also made in God's image. It's, it's, a, it's a cool thing to think about. Um, God made her for us. Deshaun, she for you, right? <clears throat> Mike, that's the one. Right? That's the one. It's, it's an awesome thing. God said it's not good that man is alone. He creates all the animals. He created all that stuff. Then, then to Adam, he names, you know, he gives him, he gives him the name and he names him. Verse 20, the search was on, but nothing was found. And Adam, look at verse 20 of, the, of Genesis chapter 2. He says, And Adam gave name to all the cattle, to the fowl of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a help meet for him. He didn't have nothing. And uh, Brandon, you're going to have a help meet here in a little bit, the end of this month. It's a wonderful thing. It's an exciting thing. It's a great thing. So God's solution to man's problem was, verse 21, And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of the, his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. You see this gift. You see this picture. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. That's that idea. Um, that Adam names her this special relationship. He gave her, he gave her his name, right? Uh, the woman, that, in the thing is Esau taken out of man ish, right? So verse, then it goes down to our theme, verse 24. Therefore shall a man cleave unto his father and his mother and shall, I'm sorry. Therefore shall a man leave his, his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. That's where we're at. That's God's ideal of marriage, his plan. He established it. He established it. Let's look it up in Proverbs chapter 18. Can somebody read that? Proverbs chapter 18, verse 22. Proverbs 18, 22. Right. You've obtained favor of the Lord. It's a good thing. God has given us a good thing. It's a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful thing. Um, now think of how society has treated women down through the years. Not good. History. It's not good. Uh, and yet, and here God commands, he, 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 he commands us as husbands to cherish, to love. Let's look in, uh, in 1 Peter chapter 3. Back to, back to, we're all over tonight. I think it's good. 1 Peter chapter 3. I think of, you think of, uh, think of uh, the resurrection, right? Think of the resurrection, how God treats women. The resurrection, where were the guys? Christ is in the tomb. The guys are scattered. They're hiding. And the, and the ladies are coming to the tomb. Maybe they knew. Maybe Mary knew. Well, wait, didn't he say in the third day? Right? It was the women. And he showed himself to the women. You know, all this thing. God is favored to, to the women, to the help me. Right? God, God, is, God is, is so good. God is so good to us. And look at, in First Peter chapter 3, verse 7, it says, Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together in the grace of life. Right? The Bible commands men to love, to cherish to honor. Hey guys, how, how's that going? Are we doing that? Are we doing that? Listen, make no mistake. Men, <coughs> men are to lead, right? Men are to lead. Men are to lead this, uh, our, our thing. Uh, the lead and the wife is to submit. So question, oh, you know, obey your husband always. Do you always have to obey in everything? That's a question. Um, you know, I think I think man man's authority, the husband's authority, is given by God, right? It's given by God. So when God asks, when when the husband asks her to do something that's contrary to God's word, she can say respectfully, no, right? Right? It's not. This isn't some blank check where where the Bible talks about that. He he doesn't do that. Um, I I believe the you know the the wife the wife's main focus then. 
uh, in, in, this, in this thing is her family and her husband. Let's look in uh, Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. Titus chapter 2, verse 4 and 5 says, That they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husband, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husband, that the word of God may not be, be, be not blasphemed. Right? Um, the wife's main focus is the family, right? It's the servant to, ser to serve her husband, right? Serve the family. Um, God's, God's, word, God's word clearly it clearly states that we are the wife is the wife is to submit to the husband. For as the husband and the wife are to become one, we have to fulfill those roles, right? That's what the specific role. Um, so maybe sometimes maybe we need to sit down and talk to your husband, to your wife. Maybe this would spark a little debate, or not a debate, but just a conversation. Hey, how's it going? How are we doing? So, listen, men, we have blind spots, right? I think we would all agree we got blind spots. Um, just a quick story. We, we were on a trip. We went on a snowmobile trip, um, and I just heard this story. I didn't even know this even happened. And so my wife wasn't there. So I'm there with my grandson and my son and his wife. And we were snowmobiling, we get back to the truck, we're getting ready to leave, and I'm, I start the truck and I move it. And uh, it was cold, it was, I don't know, below zero. But uh, I wasn't cold, you know, so the, they were cold. And I didn't even know, I didn't even know. I have this blind spot. Now, if my wife would have been there, when I, I, I started the truck and it's warming up, I moved, I had to get the trailer hooked, all this kind of stuff. So I shut the truck off. I'm, I'm fine. You know, I'm busy. I'm moving around. They're freezing and I shut the truck off. Now they're cold. And I just heard this. I just, they were over this the other day and they're telling the story and I just happened to walk in. Hey, hey, what, what? You know, I didn't even know any of this, you know, well, start the truck. Who cares? Let it warm. I, what, I've a, we have a blind spot. That's just one example of blind spots, but we have an inadequacies, right? We lack things. <laughs> we have needs. We have needs. We're trying to do, you know, trying to do things um, that we can't, right? It just, it happens, right? So, um, <clears throat> so as we, as we go through this thing, um, we, we have problems, we have some things, and God gave us a wife to, to be this unique helper, right? To be this unique helper. One of the, one of our greatest, this generation's greatest philosophers, Rocky, <clears throat> he says, and you might remember this, she's got gaps, right? She's got gaps. You know the story. I got gaps. Together we fill the gaps. And that's exactly what has to, that's what, exactly what happened. It's so true. And Rocky said it. But wives, there are so many things, there are so many ways that you can fill the gaps and be this helper. I, I think there, there's a whole bunch of things. I just wrote down a, just a couple as we finish up here. But make home a safe place. Make home a safe place. A place that you want to come home to. Right? This world is off the rails and it, it truly is, and, I, and, and I'm, I feel sad. I feel sad for the people. There's, there's people that are growing up now, and they think, well, this is normal. This is a normal marriage, or, or why even marriage? Or I'm a, I'm a woman, but I think I'm, you know, th are, th I, I feel sad, right? There's, there's kids being taught in college today that you don't need a husband, and women are being taught this and that. It's, it's, it's sad. It truly is. They don't know the truth, right? They don't know the truth, but we have the truth, and and, and wives, make your home a safe place, a place of encouragement, right? A place of comfort, understanding, a, a refuge, a refuge, right? The workplace, sometimes the workplace is rough, dealing with unreasonable people, maybe unreasonable boss, overbearing. But if I can just make it home, right? If we can just make it home. That's, that's, that's what you're trying to cultivate, right? Make your home a safe place. I, ha I have a coworker. He's 75, 76 years old. He works every day. He doesn't want to retire because he'd have to be at home. I'm like, dude, <laughs> retire, go home. He doesn't want to be on oh, his family. They're messed up or this. So he comes into work. He doesn't need the money. I guarantee it. I worked with him for 40, over 40 years and He's probably, you know, that house he's been living in for 50 years, you know, and, he, you know, he doesn't need the money. He just doesn't want to go home. It's like, is that sad or what? That's, that's what I'm saying. Make your home a safe place. Wives, you can really help your husband by making your home a sweet haven. 
How about this? Um, number two, help your husband by being dependable, trustworthy. We just read those verses in Proverbs 31, um, but just uh, uh, you can depend on. You, you know, you, you can depend on. How about Ephesians 4.32? I think we all know that. Let's look, let's look there, and this will be our last verse we look at. But Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 32. This just isn't for Sunday school kids, right? This isn't just for the neighbors. This is for your husband too. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 32 says this, And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. Be long-suffering, be forgiving, forbearing, kind, right? The, we, can lump, we can lump your husband right into that thing. There's all kinds of ways to build unity and oneness, right? That's a goal. But be on the same team. Be on the same team. When the kids come along, um, we see it, you see it all the time, right? There's a, one parent teams up with a, a teenage kid, right? And then they, they go against dad or they go against mom. What an awful thing. What an awful thing. Man, kids, uh, you know, uh, we need to stand together. Uh, a husband and wife need to cooperate as parents. This is how we're going to raise this kid, right? We need to stand united against little Buford, right? We need to do that. The wife's attitude is quickly picked up, picked up by the children in a, in a, in a good way or a bad way. And lastly, but not least, pray. How about this? We can pray for our husband. Um, <laughs> he needs it. Why? Because I know I need it, right? But not only, not only does he need it, but so do you. How many times have you, if this ever happened to you, you're, you're praying about something and you already have an outcome in your mind. All right, I'm praying about this and this is what should happen. Boom, boom, boom. You know, my wife should do this or this or, you know, my father-in-law or whatever it is. They, you already have that outcome in your mind. You start praying about it and what happens? And somehow your mind gets changed. Like maybe the problem wasn't my wife. Maybe that problem was me. God turns that thing around on us. So it's, it's important to pray for your husband. Pray for him. Pray for him. You give him strength. Give him strength to be the leader that he should be, right? Um, we, we need to pray you know, in, in those things. We have a choice. So, so bottom line, we have a choice to make. God's way for our marriage or the world's way, right? God's role for a wife and a husband you know, that's, that's it. God's rule for a husband and wife. It's not easy. It's definitely not easy. But listen, we have instructions. We have the instructions. We, have the ins we can find them. We can find what we need right in God's word. So, so the choice, I say let's, let's choose God's way, right? right? Does that make any, any of that make sense? All right, 10 to 8. Let's have a word of prayer and we'll be dismissed.